Information Technology Leaders is sponsored by the Microsoft Corporation, a worldwide leader in software, services, and internet technologies for personal and business computing. Microsoft offers a wide range of products and services designed to empower people through software, anytime, any place, and on any device. This week on Information Technology Leader, Sanjay Parthasarathay, Corporate Vice President of the Platform Strategy and Partner Group at Microsoft. Now here's your host, Laura Schildkraut. Today's guest is Microsoft's Corporate Vice President for the Platform Strategy and Partner Group. He grew up in India and excelled in college there. But after graduating with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering, he wasn't sure what he wanted to do. So he attended graduate school in the U.S. at MIT. After completing a master's degree in engineering, he still wasn't sure what he wanted to do and began a master's degree in management at MIT Sloan School. Research work in multimedia conducted to help finance his education interested Microsoft, and he called the company home for the past 13 plus years. He says that career success is a blend of conscious decisions and luck. Seems to me there's more to it than that. Please welcome Sanjay Parthasarathy. Okay. So where did you grow up? I grew up in India mm -hmm. in a city called Madras, which yeah. is the fourth largest city in India. Mm -hmm. And I spent 21 years there yeah. uh, before I came to the U.S. Before coming here. What are some of the core similarities and differences between growing up in the U.S. and growing up in India? Um, kids are the same mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, they have the same issues. They have the same interests. And uh, we grew up quite familiar with um, all the music, all mm -hmm. the, you know, kind of popular culture uh, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. You're telling me differences in terms of the way families operate in some ways. Um, there is a little bit more of a nuclear family. Mm -hmm. um, all my relatives, my cousins, 100 and plus of them, <laughs> you know, it felt like uh, we're all in the same city. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit, you know, a little bit more intense. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, you run into your uh, cousins everywhere. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's a good thing. Yeah, but well, you're right. it probably doesn't yeah. happen that much here. What did your father do for a living? Well, he's an engineer. He mm -hmm. wasn't. He is an engineer still, and um, yeah, he started his own um, companies, um, mm -hmm. manufacturing automobile components. And so he tried to get me to be um, a mechanical engineer too. Yeah. Did you ever work for him? Uh, only in summer, and mm -hmm. I figured out pretty quickly <laughs> I wasn't any good. <laughs> so. what, what do you mean you weren't any good? Well, he he had me start off at the bottom. And the first yeah, who week, would have thought he'd make you do that? <laughs> the first week, mm -hmm. he had me file a little piece of metal mm -hmm. from about that big to that big, and mm -hmm. I don't think that worked. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so was uh, he doing that as a learning experience? For yeah, you? I think he was. Yeah. Yeah. And what was the takeaway from that? The takeaway was maybe there's other more interesting <laughs> things for me <laughs> to do. Interesting ways to make a living. So, what were you like in high school? I think I was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. um, I used to play a lot of uh, sport mm -hmm. um, and I used to spend a lot of time on my academics and mm -hmm. I didn't really have much time for anything else mm -hmm. and pretty focused. Yeah. Was cricket an important part of growing up? Yeah, I used to be pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. um, I, used to, I used to play it a lot and um, I've even played in a professional league. Really? Yeah, for a few years and you know that, mm -hmm. that really was actually very mm -hmm. good training. Training for? For, for, for uh, mm -hmm. life and, mm -hmm. and, and work. How so? Because it kind of, you know, any sport, it, you know, it shows you how to win, shows mm -hmm. you how to lose. It mm -hmm. kind of gives you, gives you kind of perspective, mm -hmm. and uh, those are all useful. Yeah, and sort of the discipline of working hard. Right. And, and, that, and that being necessary. Pretty important. When did you first know you were smart? Ah, <laughs> probably in 10th grade. Mm -hmm. And, um, we have competitive examinations, you know, 10th and 12th mm -hmm. grade, and um, I ranked pretty high, and mm -hmm. it was the first time I realized, mm. okay, yeah. not everybody's like it. this. Yeah. yeah. 
Do you remember how you scored on your 12th grade competitive exam? 12th was, it, it went downhill from 10th for a few <laughs> years. Um, Did you just that, get that cocky was, or? No, that was teenage uh -huh. life, I mm -hmm. guess. Uh, but then it picked back up um, after I was 21 or 22. Yeah. So with relatively high scores, which college did you attend and how did you make that decision? Um, from high school, I went to a local engineering college, mm -hmm. um, partly because I just, it, it helped, it kind of, I could play cricket um, anytime I wanted okay. uh, there. Well, it's always good to have your priorities straight, that's isn't right. it? That's right, mm -hmm. that's right, that's um, right. And so after that, um, I came to the U.S. Mm -hmm. uh, to get a real education, if you will. Yeah. It's surprising to me that after your experience with your dad working in mechanical engineering that you decided to get a degree in that when clearly it didn't seem that appealing to you. Well, it, it's the way the system works in India. I mm -hmm. mean, depending upon how you rank, you get slotted into a particular really? um, type of um, course, degree, whatever it is. And it just happened to be where I, the dice mm -hmm. fell, really. Mm -hmm. It wasn't really a choice. Yeah. Did you always know that you'd go to graduate school, or did you think you'd work for a few years first? No, I knew I was going to go to grad school. Mm -hmm. Is that I mean, just kind of the system? Is it? Yeah. Is it there? Very yeah. academically focused. Yeah, you could say that. Make structure on that. How did you select MIT? Well, because mm -hmm. nobody else was applying to MIT from, you know, from uh, my college, and I figured it'd be easier to get in <laughs> if you didn't have to compete with with your um, with your peers. So that was. It ended up being okay. Yeah, I mean, obviously it ended up working for you. It's kind yeah. of interesting logic because yeah. you're competing with a whole lot of other people. Right. But, but that was okay. That's right. Yeah. Were you nervous or excited to leave your homeland to come to the United States? Um, I was just curious. I mean, mm -hmm. it's kind of the done thing, so it was kind of obvious <laughs> and it was, didn't pose any you know, major concerns. Yeah. Regarding the transition, you told me that you thought that guys from Georgia had a harder time than you did. Why was that? Because we were kind of mentally prepared for it, and mm -hmm. you know, we it, there, there's a whole bunch of us who came here. Um, we were expecting it; it was what we were supposed to do. And I found it, you know, MIT and the East Coast, Cambridge, mm -hmm. uh, Massachusetts. I mean, you really have a variety of people, and you kind of, you know, have every type of person, and it was quite easy to feel at home. So you sort you of know, find your place. Yeah, and you know, the folks from Georgia. <laughs> found it a little bit harder. Yeah, yeah. With, with their accents, because maybe there, there's an expectation that their accents will be more no, similar. No, no, I think I think, I think it, 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 it's just different. I've never that's been to Georgia. Much. Well, actually, yeah. I have mm -hmm. to Atlanta, but it's not the rest of Georgia. No, that's not. How did graduate school differ from college, sort of academically and socially? Oh, graduate school was very different because you know you basically had to define what it what it is you wanted to do, and for the first year, I mm -hmm. didn't have very much of an idea what mm -hmm. I wanted to do and you know they kind of let you take the time to find your interests and find the topics that are um, that you're interested mm -hmm. in and then kind of do something. Mm -hmm. So having that freedom was a little daunting was, or exciting? It was, or? it was different. Yeah. Yeah I was used to taking six courses a semester mm -hmm. um, and just you know grinding through um, those courses mm -hmm. and here it was three courses over two years and the rest of it was just you know, research work. Wow. And yeah. did, did you enjoy that part or did you feel like you weren't pushing hard enough? No, no. I, I, after, after a while, I really got into mm -hmm. it and, uh, you know, really started to explore some interesting concepts. Mm -hmm. Yet after you graduated or after you got that degree, you still weren't sure what you wanted to do. How did you decide that you wanted to go for a management degree and why stay at MIT? Well, I mean, I, I, I thought of it more as finishing school um, mm -hmm. because, um, I didn't quite understand how business worked um, outside of India, mm -hmm. and um, I thought that would be kind of the right, right finishing mm -hmm. touch, and so it kind of made sense. Mm -hmm. And why stay at the same school? It's just easier to get in. Mm -hmm. Line of least resistance. That's right. Yeah. Right. And it's uh, it's hard to find a better school. It's obviously yeah, it, it's, it, it, it's it a worked very good out school. fine. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so you never really envisioned yourself as becoming a perpetual student. You knew that after this degree you were going to be done with education, That's or right. were you still I, not sure? No, I, I was pretty sure mm -hmm. I was in PhD material. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Didn't have the application for that. To do that. What are some of the things that you did to fund your education? Well, uh, I was a research assistant mm -hmm. throughout, I, I think, for about three years, of the four years I was there. And um, at business school, for example, 
um, I proposed um, a multimedia project mm -hmm. to, uh, to Glenn Urban, who was my advisor there. Um, and he had an interest in simulating uh, virtual environments mm -hmm. and, and, and his, his area was uh, automobiles and so he wanted to kind of simulate a buying process like a consumer mm -hmm. buying mm -hmm. a car uh, he wanted to see if uh, the process could be the same in a virtual world um, as opposed to a real world mm -hmm. and uh, yeah that's what that's what we did for mm -hmm. two years and you had fun working on that project it was great yeah so as you approach graduation you sent a resume to Microsoft yeah and what happened uh, they didn't call back. No. <laughs> no. Was that really frustrating? No. I, I, I it, you know, you send out a hundred, mm -hmm. two hundred resumes, and some of them are interested, and it, it was, it was kind of the law of numbers, and it mm -hmm. didn't really occur to me that Microsoft hadn't called back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Had other companies called back? Yeah, a couple others had consulting mm -hmm. companies, but. Mm -hmm. How did you eventually get a second chance with Microsoft? Well, every Thursday we have this thing called consumption function where mm -hmm. the students at, MI, at Sloan kind of get together in the lobby. Um, and that day, apparently, uh, Microsoft was recruiting and the, and the recruiters were at the consumption function. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of beer at these mm -hmm. functions. Yeah, we used to just call them beer blasts. And, right. You know, they That's right. Consumption function. Um, and I got talking to a couple of the, the people who were there from, mm -hmm. from Microsoft. Uh, and we got talking about the project I was doing. Mm -hmm. And uh, ended up taking them to my lab and showing them what, we'd, what mm -hmm. I'd done. Mm -hmm. Actually, there was a group of us who, was, uh, who, were, who were working on it. And um, they had me come out mm -hmm. as a result of that. Did you mention that you had sent them a resume and not heard from no, them? Not no, not at that point, no. <laughs> not, not necessary. No. So tell us about the Microsoft interview process. Well, I'd just been to Brazil for about three or four weeks, so I was in a happy mood. Yeah, well, they'll and, fix that. And uh, January 6th, <laughs> I was, uh, January 6th of, uh, uh, what was it, uh, 1990, um, I flew into Seattle. It was bright, you know, sunny day, and the interview started about 8 o'clock, and it went on till about 10 or 11 at night, mm -hmm. and so it was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. How did it work? Well, you'd, you kind of meet with, for every hour, 45 minutes, you'd meet with one person, and then you'd go on to the next one, and amazingly, they knew mm -hmm. exactly what the previous person had kind of mm -hmm. asked you and, you know, what else to kind of talk to yeah. you about, and it was, yeah. it, was, it, was, it was a blur, actually. How, how long did it take you to figure out what was going on in the background? I, actually, I don't think I actually figured it out until very late, mm -hmm. uh, probably about 4 or 5 o'clock, oh. but... Because I remember at my interview, I felt like I was getting a lot of different questions, but I was also getting some of the same questions. And by the end, I couldn't remember whether I had told a specific story or example before. And I found myself saying, did I already say this? Did I already right. say this? Because no, you, you do. You, you kind of get into this <coughs> zone. You, yeah, you, you, you do get very blurry. Know. Do you remember any of the questions? Yeah. I, I thought it was really weird that um, I got asked questions about architecture, hmm. building architecture. So one guy asked me, how I'd build a house or how I'd design a house. And, mm -hmm. uh, interestingly enough, I was interested in it, and so I made it up. Mm -hmm. And I ended up actually architecting my own Did house. Did you really? Yeah. Later on. Had you interviewed with other companies? I had, um, with a couple. Mm -hmm. Yeah, McKinsey was one, mm -hmm. uh, for example. Yeah. How did the interviews differ? Oh, the McKinsey ones were, I mean, they were, they were very scripted. I mean, they were going after a set of issues and mm -hmm. here it was very unscripted it was it was what are your interests you know kind of a couple of riddles a couple of these you know mm -hmm. off the wall mm -hmm. you know left field kind of questions it didn't it didn't seem mm -hmm. scripted at all yeah was your not having had work experience an issue not really no yeah. no i think it's an issue in screening mm -hmm. once you get in front mm -hmm. of people i don't think I me mean, at a company like Microsoft, I mean, I, I keep pointing out to people, when the chairman doesn't really have a formal degree, yeah. there's not that much <laughs> that people yeah. look for in terms mm -hmm. of experience. Yeah, it's just so critical you can be. That's right. I mean, it's, it's, it's who you are. Mm -hmm. Well, since you hadn't done a lot of interviewing, why were you so ready to accept the Microsoft offer? It's the only offer, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, what, what choice did I have? <laughs> well, you could have continued to look. Remember, it was recession time then, mm, that's right? True. What and year was this? 1990. Yeah. And, you know, offers weren't coming thick and fast, mm -hmm. but, you know, one's all you need. Yep. What was your first title in the scope of your responsibility? Um, 
I, it was associate product manager. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the associate was really important because there was assistant product managers who were kind of lower in the totem pole. Mm -hmm. And, you know, at least you didn't start at the, right. the bottom, bottom of the food chain. Because apparently you didn't like that when your dad did it to nope. you, so not going to have that happen again. Did you feel well prepared to do the work? Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. I think, um, you know, there was a, it, three of us who started together, one from UCLA, I think, one from Harvard, and myself. And, you know, we were just gung-ho. Mm -hmm. At that point, it, it, was, it was a new area, so there wasn't any preparation needed. And I was actually the most, quote-unquote, qualified because I'd actually done two right. years of work on this right. thing. So even though it wasn't traditional work experience, it was no, still that's right. probably more work in the field yeah, than others, the issues. others had done. Mm -hmm. Did anything surprise you about that first year in a professional work environment? Since you hadn't really worked before. No, um, well, the intensity surprised me. Mm -hmm. um, you know, my first boss was Rob Glazer, and Ooh, yeah. it was pretty intense. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the intensity was surprising. Mm -hmm. How hard were you working? Didn't count the hours, but, you know, it was seven days a week. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when you're new in Seattle, and if you didn't grow up here, you really don't have any connections. So work was, uh, work was good. Mm -hmm. You know, work was, work was therapy. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. you know, it felt like all the time. Mm -hmm. Were you doing any evangelism at this point? Right. No, I, w I mm -hmm. was, um, I was uh, evangelizing, if you will. Um, Windows, mm -hmm. Windows 3.0, to game developers and education, mm -hmm. you know, uh, software companies. Mm -hmm. What were some of the traits required to be an exceptional evangelist? I like to say more initiative than common sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, you know, it's better to not know your limits. Mm -hmm. And um, the, more, the more you're aware of what can go wrong, uh, the worse off mm -hmm. you are. Kind of like how children have no fear and yep. they just... Take, like take chances. Mm -hmm. Yeah. About two and a half years later, you decided to move into interactive TV. Why the move? Well, it was kind of logical because um, multimedia computers started to come into the market in '92. Mm -hmm. um, then we started to look at devices connected to TVs, kind of you know without the the PC screen. Mm -hmm. And then that evolved into interactive TV. Mm -hmm. And so it was kind of a logical progression. Mm -hmm. How did the roles differ? Um, only in the sense that I had more people working for me at that point. Mm -hmm. Did you enjoy that, the managerial yeah, responsibilities? Yeah, I, I loved it, yeah. yeah. Work, you know, working in a team has always been fun. I mean, playing cricket, you play with right. a team of, of 10 others. Mm -hmm. And uh, I never loved the, the individual sports. Mm -hmm. Even when I played tennis, um, I, I, I loved tennis uh, playing doubles mm -hmm. compared to singles. Yeah. yeah. When you work on a team, do you prefer being the leader or? Uh, yes. With the success of the internet, mm -hmm. your work started changing. How did it start shifting? Well, I, I was in, in the advanced consumer technology, the interactive TV group for about a couple of years. 95, 96 was when Bill sent out his famous, you know, internet tidal wave memo. Mm -hmm. And at that point, it was just all hands on deck. And, uh, you know, we dropped or we, we took everything that we were doing and looked at um, how we could make it ready or available on the internet. And, and that's how I got into my you know, internet commerce and security work. Right. Um, so now you're a product unit manager, so right. you'd had a promotion. What are some of the skills that you think you demonstrated that made you promotion worthy? I, I think competitive intensity. Mm -hmm. um, remember at that time, we had to focus on something that was very different, um, had, had a very different set of characteristics in, in Netscape time, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, my competitive intensity kind of helped. So what types of things were you responsible for delivering? Because you'd been kind of in a research group and then suddenly right. it's make it real. Right. So we had to deliver technology uh, that worked in, you know, shipping products, whether mm -hmm. it was um, Windows 95 or Internet Explorer and we had to do it you know we had to take research and turn it into product in six to nine months mm -hmm. and you kind of had to you know feel really motivated and, and you had to get a level of intensity up to do that mm -hmm. um, and that's what I was good at. Did you feel really clear about what you were trying to accomplish or 
was clarity the first thing that needed to be defined, and then you figured out what to do? Um, no, it wasn't. It wasn't very clear. I mean, it got clearer maybe three, four, five years later. Mm. But then it was just, you know, let's yeah. let's let's respond. Let's mm -hmm. let's get something out. Yeah. And I think we did all right. Yeah. You said you shipped within a year. Yeah, I it was believe. actually nine months. Nine months. Was success ever in doubt? Did you ever have times when you thought you weren't going to do it? Um, I don't think I don't think we knew what success was at that point. Mm -hmm. I think we were so focused at the end of every day, the end of every week, you know, kind of getting through the ship cycle, that there really wasn't much else. Mm -hmm. yeah. Was it exhausting or did you yeah, love it? Yeah, it? It, was, it was pretty exhausting. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think I burned out at the end of it. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, because at the end of it, you said that you cajoled and pleaded your way into another job. Why did you want that job and why did it require cajoling and pleading? Well, I mean, first thing, I had to take some time off. Mm -hmm. So um, my wife and I, uh, went off to Africa for, for a month. I thought about it, and I just realized I wanted to do something completely different. And so I hadn't been out in the field, as they say, mm -hmm. um, selling. I mean, I'd done a lot of um, evangelizing, but I wasn't responsible for revenue, you know, a P&L, mm -hmm. and I wanted to do something different. Now, mm -hmm. it, wasn't, it wasn't very usual at that point for people in Redmond mm -hmm. to want to go, right. you know, do something in the yeah. field. But I thought that was something that I needed to do. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't obvious to people why I should be the person to do mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. During this Africa trip, did you ever consider moving to another company? Or was it just, I need to do something different within Microsoft, and that was just a given for you? It was just something different. It, mm -hmm. wasn't, it wasn't so much the company mm -hmm. as opposed to, I need to exercise a different part of my mm -hmm. brain. So how, how did this position particularly appeal to you, and what was the position? It was, um, India at that point, um, we had a, Microsoft had a reasonably small operation there. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to, one, see if I could, you know, go back, mm -hmm. roots of course, uh, but see if I can grow it up to mm -hmm. where it was a, it was a reasonably sized business for Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And I thought I could do it because um, I loved growing things. Mm -hmm. And um, I didn't think it was going to be that difficult to learn how to do it. Oh. So, were you, did you find the challenge daunting, or you were really ready for a new a new challenge? As long as it was flexing different muscles, it wasn't daunting, um, but it was kind of scary, mm -hmm. different. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it wasn't so much, um, you know, can I really do it? It's just it was a different rhythm. Mm -hmm. When you're in a sales group, you have to meet quotas every quarter, mm -hmm. right? And you know, my boss was pretty intense, Orlando Ayala. Ayala. Yes, he is. Um, you know, kind of had an informal, you know, you got to make, you got to mm -hmm. make a quota. And mm -hmm. you can't afford to miss it twice in a row. Mm -hmm. And so that intensity was quite a different type mm -hmm. of intensity. Different from the product groups have to, right. having to ship in nine months? That's right. Because this is, this is every three months <laughs> you have a goal. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just a little different. Yeah. During this time, you also commuted back and forth. I think you were doing six weeks in South Asia and two weeks in the United States. Right. How was that working for you? Well, my wife is a doctor, and mm -hmm. uh, she was practicing, and uh, she, she had a, her practice here. And so we reached an agreement that I'd go back and forth, and she'd continue to practice. And so I'd spent six weeks there, two weeks here. Mm -hmm. And as it worked out, I needed to do a lot of work here. Mm -hmm. like um, convincing our product groups that India really was a market and it mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, they really did use PCs out there at that mm -hmm. time. And so I, I did a lot of evangelism within Microsoft at that point. Mm -hmm. So it was really helpful to have those skills in terms, of, in terms of how mm -hmm. to do that. How did it feel kind of being back home working? I mean, home broadly speaking. In India? Yeah. Um, it, was, it, was, it was fun. I mean, I never... I, w I never was in a city more than three days in a row. Mm -hmm. And so when people ask me where I lived, I'd say on a plane. Yeah. Um, and I just got to see a lot of places I hadn't seen when mm -hmm. I was growing up in India. Mm -hmm. Meet a lot of new people um, that I hadn't yeah. had a chance to meet. Got, got involved in a lot of new types of issues that I hadn't mm -hmm. kind of like dealt with. You know, when I was there, Bill, Bill, Bill was there in 1997. Mm -hmm. And it was the... I don't know, it, it, was, it was an event. And uh, I'd never particularly kind of met or talked or interacted with politicians, for example. Mm -hmm. And every politician wanted to meet with them. And so that was different. Mm -hmm. And were you the go-between? 
Um, yes. Yeah. You have any fun with that? Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> um, and uh, you know, it was just it was just a different. Again, it's just it mm -hmm. exercised a different uh, part of my brain. Yeah. And just different day-to-day -day activity. Yep. And it's what you spend your time doing. What are some of your proudest accomplishments from that time? Uh, that that was, um, you know, just just getting getting India as on on the map mm -hmm. um, was was pretty overwhelming, but also satisfying. I think um, it was right around that time frame that India started to realize that it had a core competence mm -hmm. in software, mm -hmm. and you know, I know I had nothing to do with it, but right. um, it was it was already kind of set. Mm -hmm. But you know, every once in a while, you kind of think. You just yeah. added to that. Yeah, that, to you, that, that you moved um, it forward. That that right. movement, yeah. yeah. And that must be a very proud feeling. No, but if you, no. You, you don't you don't let it you don't get carried away with it. Yeah. But it's just you know, mm -hmm. when you're 60, you kind of will <laughs> think about it and, and say, yeah, it. that was all right. Mm -hmm. Did you feel like you sort of fell in love with your homeland again? Um, yes and no. Mm -hmm. um, it was it, it it was it was looking at it very differently, um, and. Uh, the things that you care about most, you kind of always have a love-hate relationship because you know right. it can be better. Right. Um, but you always find the things that you love. Mm -hmm. Well, in November of 1997, about two years after you talked your way into this position, you talked your way back out of it. Why did you talk your way out of well, that role? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was in Sri Lanka, uh, November um, 5th, 1997. I got a call, um, actually November um, Sixth, 1997, uh, 1997, and I got a call from my wife. She was expect we were expecting at that time. Uh, it was supposed to be four weeks later, and uh, she said she had to go to the hospital. And um, so I was on the phone for the next what 12 hours. Because mm. um, you knew you couldn't get back. No, I couldn't get you back. Couldn't get it back. takes 30 hours to get right. there, uh, get, get there from here or back. And uh, walked her through labor on the phone. And uh, then caught the fl first flight possible. Mm -hmm. um, two days later, I was here, and then it just didn't feel like the right thing to do at mm -hmm. that point to commute. Yeah, and so then your daughter was born. That's right. Um, so then I had to talk my way back mm -hmm. to something back here. So what role did you take on when you came back? So when I came back, um, I I had to run Microsoft.com, which mm -hmm. is you know Microsoft's website. Um, it was the 12th largest website at that point in time. Um, it's grown up to now be in mm -hmm. the top three or five. Yeah. And you became a general manager. Right. So again, what kind of characteristics were you displaying at this point that made them confident that you could handle that role? Um, again, I just, I just think it was attitude more than anything wow. else. It's just more attitude Good than Good attitude will only take you so far. No, no it goes a long way. Because if you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you're willing to go deal with the hard problems, that's an mm -hmm. attitude. If you're not willing to back down, that's an attitude. Then, right. then you can. Then they they put you in places where you can deal with the hard problems. Well, there's one thing that, about not being willing to back down, but you've got to have the ability to to do it. That's right. And I well. think that too is an attitude. Really. That's right. Okay. Good for you. Can do attitude. That's true. Yeah. So, how large was your staff, and then what was the focus of the organization specifically? Um, at that point, I think it was close to a thousand people. Mm-hmm. And. Um, it was, it was not just Microsoft.com, but a whole lot of other um, mm -hmm. IT uh, for the sales and marketing side of Microsoft. Mm -hmm. And that was, that was, that was a very interesting. That, yeah. that was when I was probably pushed the most mm -hmm. um, because attitude alone <laughs> doesn't <laughs> work yeah, with a thousand people. Yeah. So that was really almost where you s stepped from management to leadership in a way in terms uh, of no, your No, you skills. stepped from leadership to management. Really? Right, because... Um, with small groups, mm -hmm. you can lead, and the team, um, when you have a reasonably small team, um, you can lead just with attitude and intensity and, you know, a set of ideas. Mm -hmm. When you have a large team, you can't just lead, you also have to manage, mm -hmm. because you have to manage issues, um, you know, day-to-day -day issues, um, such as, you know, people feeling good or bad, you know, uh, having a you know, bad day. You can't have an attitude about that. Mm -hmm. You have to manage that. Mm -hmm. Did you feel ready for this level of responsibility? No, that was the first time I didn't feel ready for mm -hmm. something. And I had to learn management. Mm -hmm. What specifically 
did you need to improve or strengthen to do that? I mean, management is a very broad thing. What sort of more tangibly? Communication. Mm -hmm. And communication where a large part of communication was listening mm -hmm. as opposed to, I was pretty good at communication Outward. talking, <laughs> right? Because that was my job. Right. But communication listening is a little bit harder. Mm -hmm. And why did it become so much more important now? Because if you're going to manage and if you're actually going to lead beyond what you are capable of, right, mm -hmm. to, to beyond what you're capable mm -hmm. of, you actually have to listen to people because they have views that you can actually learn from. Mm. And so it's not just managing people but, mm -hmm. all, but actually stretching beyond what you're personally mm -hmm. capable of. So as you started doing more of that, did you feel you had a natural talent in that area or is that something that is still needing to be a conscious effort to, to work at? Um, everybody can listen a lot more. Mm -hmm. There's never an end to that. Uh, but I realized that the more I listened, the more I could help reduce complexity by mm -hmm. playing it back. Mm -hmm. And the ability to synthesize or simplify mm -hmm. what you hear um, became a core competence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Almost that ability to get to clarity, which is something you learned earlier in your career. Almost. Almost just, it's simpl it's, simplification is an end to itself, I mm -hmm. think. Um, and clarity might come and will come over time. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, just boiling it down to a few things um, is very, very useful. Did you feel at this point as though you were on Microsoft's management fast track? Um, kind of, sort of, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how does that happen? Um, we, th we, have, we have various programs. Um, that kind of grow people. Um, we have programs like, w which we call bench programs. Um, we have um, strategy conferences where, you know, you go meet some of the senior management. And so, yeah, I was, I was in that. Mm -hmm. And so you realized that you were one of the chosen in a way. Um, one of the, I don't know if chosen is the word, one of the people who are in the spotlight. Um, mm -hmm. Not everybody makes it. Um, mm -hmm. If you have your spot, if you have the spotlight on them, mm -hmm. were you pretty convinced you were going to be one of the ones that did? No, I cared deeply that I did. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I wasn't sure if, if I was going to. Mm -hmm. Tell us about the Siebel CRM project and how that went. Um, this was this was in the early days of CRM, um, customer, customer relationship. relationship management, and um, we realized as a company that we needed to to get a, a system in place that kind of was an organizing principle more than anything else, a discipline, uh, a process uh, for a company that really had, you know, very, very entrepreneurial genes. Mm -hmm. And we thought of it more of a cultural process, kind of discipline issue, less of a technology issue. Mm -hmm. And um, I was working for Steve Bummer at that point in time. And he was, he was interested in seeing if, um, if we could use that to get a little bit more process into our, um, mm -hmm. into the way we, you know, worked with customers, mm -hmm. the way our sales force worked with customers. Mm -hmm. And so I got kind of handed that um, as a, as a, again, a trial. Mm -hmm. And that sounds very complicated. Sounds it is like very there's a, complicated. a lot of like herding cats. Absolutely. Yeah. Because, you know, when, when you do something in um, information technology in a large company, it's never, almost never about the technology. Right. It's about the culture. Right. And did you see that going into the project nope. right away? Didn't get it. Nope. Up front. How long did it take? Oh, it, for you to get it. It took me about. I I think I just got it. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, maybe a couple, couple of years ago. Uh huh. Yeah. So, what are some of the things that you did, the tactics that you did that made that work and come about? I'm not sure it worked really. Really. The first time around, and mm -hmm. I think I mean you, you got You got to keep with it to get it to work. It takes about two or three ti you know, tries mm -hmm. when something that, that major to get it to work. It didn't work the first time around, mm -hmm. but I learned a lot from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I think you've also said that you learn almost as much from your failures as That's your right. successes. That's right. Uh, so after about two years, you said you'd kind of reached the end of your rope. What was going on? Well, I mean, it was, remember again, when you have a child that's less than three years old, yes. you don't get much sleep. No. And when you're rolling out something like, mm -hmm. you know, a big project, you don't get much sleep uh, either. And that combination, you know, you kind of can't burn the candle at two ends. 
And, um, you know, at that point, I just needed to do something, again, a little bit different. Um, I figured I'd learned some things very important from the Siebel project. You know, that's when I got, and, and, and actually from Microsoft.com, mm -hmm. you know, that's when I got um, introduced to XML, right. uh, kind of the technology that's changed my life, at least in the last five years. Um, and um, I, f I knew that that technology was going to mm -hmm. go somewhere. Um, and I wanted to do something about it. So you didn't just feel after this burning candle at both ends that you needed a huge rest. You felt like you needed another project. You actually submitted a resignation letter. Um, I actually did. They didn't accept it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean that, but that's a, a, a real statement of I'm, I'm kind of done a little bit. No, or I was did just, you really I was know just, that they wouldn't accept it? No, I was just. It was a. It was a. It was a mental break point for me. Okay. I had to say it. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, it was kind of a weak resignation because I said, here, I'm going to go to Hawaii. <laughs> when I come back, maybe you'll have something for me. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just, it was just, a, okay. it was just a, a way to kind of say I'm ready for something else. Mm -hmm. And Paul Moritz saved you. Well, I wouldn't. <laughs> yes. I mean, in, all credit to Paul. He, mm -hmm. he, w he, he, he decided that he would tolerate me mm -hmm. uh, for, for a year or so. So what was it that really did encourage you to stay? What project? I think Paul did. Mm -hmm. I mean, really, it was, it, was, it was a combination of the technology, of course, which mm -hmm. was just, the potential was amazing. But I think it had more to do with Paul at that point. Um, Paul, was, Paul is just this amazing person. And he just has the ability I think, to, uh, to come across as an amazing person. So mm -hmm. my bet was on Paul. Okay. So he talked you into staying and gave you what to do. Well, he said, just, just go think for a while, um, which I, I did, mm -hmm. right? Um, and you, know, you have an idea, this XML thing. Um, we need to do something different in the company. Um, and let's see if we can make something out of it. And out of it came mm -hmm. .NET. Mm -hmm. So, and you were an individual contributor at this time, That's which right. you hadn't been for a very long time. That's right. That was sort of short-lived. Yeah, it lasted about six months, mm -hmm. six to nine months. Yeah, and then you started taking on different people. What you created this interesting team? Right. Tell us about that team and so what they it was did. the te team of misfits. I mean, it's all <laughs> the people who were. Somebody sent that to me in email. I just <laughs> didn't want to be the one to put that right. out no, there. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, were, we we all had. Um, we had a point of view. We had uh, it, which didn't quite align with establishment, mm -hmm. and but we had strong points of view. Mm -hmm. And um, you know Charles Fitzgerald, Vic and Dotra, um, You know these are some of the misfits who are still with me. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we decided we had to make something out of it. Mm -hmm. And what did you do? Well. I mean, uh, it was at that time Paul was Paul was driving um, the announcement of this thing called .NET, mm -hmm. and uh, Vic and Charles and I got got involved, and then from there, um, you know, we're still involved. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we kind of are the um, core evangelism team, mm -hmm. if you will, for .NET. Yeah. So evangelism, as you said, is kind of making a little bit of a comeback. Yep. And how does it differ now from when it did when you were an evangelist so many years ago? I'm not sure it's very different. Really, um, I think it's the art of uh, it is the art of persuasion, mm -hmm. um, and that's that's been around for centuries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, I think it'll it'll be with us for for a long time. This is sort of a very public position that you have now. How do you feel about dealing with the press? You said that was a big part of your early time in this role. Right. Um, I do a lot less of it mm -hmm. right now because. Charles is just better at it. I mean, there's other people that are just mm -hmm. better at it than I am. Um, so, you know, part of part of leading is also getting out of the way, mm -hmm. which I do. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that they that they do that's so wonderful with the media? Charles is just smart, mm -hmm. and um, he has the ability, I think, to um, to to give the press uh, what they need, which mm -hmm. is an insight or a quote or mm -hmm. a point of view um, that I don't do as well as he does. Mm -hmm. Well, it's one thing to give. It's another thing for them to take it. How do you make sure that they take what you're trying to give them? 
Well, I mean, it's so it's it's you you can never guarantee that, mm -hmm. and and um, you know the 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 thing about um, some people is that they leave a much more lasting impression by what they say mm -hmm. than than someone like me, for example. So, what are some of the most exciting challenges and some of the opportunities that you're seeing for the area now, for your group now? Well, I mean, we're uh, we just started to scratch really the potential of XML. Mm -hmm. So. These are these are things. I mean, these these kinds of phenomena, as technologies, whether it's Windows graphical user interface or the personal computer, they take a couple of decades. Mm -hmm. And so we're we're kind of, you know, we've scratched in the industry, it has uh, scratched and you know clawed its way to kind of the starting blocks, if you will. And so there's there's another good 10, 15 years mm -hmm. to go, in this in this area. What would be your greatest hope in terms of a, an outcome for this? Um, I think technology so far has been a tool mm -hmm. for, um, for, for people to um, share their ideas. I think it can be more of a tool to share knowledge as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that's the hope. How would you describe your management style? Uh, intense, mm -hmm. <laughs> intense. Um, kind of um, lead from the front, lead, lead with intensity. Um, and kind of just power through things. Mm -hmm. You've said that if you don't have talent, you have to work much harder. After all the success, do you think yours is more a result of tenacity than talent? Um, you know, every day I come across someone who's just smarter than I am. Mm -hmm. That's just true of everybody, sure. anybody. Right. Um, so you will. And so what differentiates you from that person? Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's something else mm -hmm. other than smart. And so no one should ever feel bad that they're not the smartest person. Mm -hmm. But they should feel bad if they're not the most kind of determined person. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've tried to kind of keep that in mind. So in terms of career management, you've said that if you start to feel too comfortable, you go off and find something that makes you uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Why has that been so important to you? And how do you know when it's time? You know, I mean, you, you kind of know, because if you're if you're doing the same thing over and over again, and you're not kind of feeling a little stretched or a little afraid or a little kind of out of out of your depth, you know. Mm -hmm. What did you mean when you said careers are what you make happen? Um, it's where some people think careers happen to them. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they do. And, you know, it happens to perfectly good, competent people. But I they think careers hoisted upon them. That's right. Yeah. And mm -hmm. um, but I think a lot of people underestimate the power of asking for things to happen. Mm -hmm. um, people are afraid to ask for things. What's the worst thing that, that can happen? They say no. Mm -hmm. um, and if you don't ask for it, you don't get because mm -hmm. somebody else is asking for it. Right. That's for sure. We talked a little bit about this. We we, we can see what successes do. Tell me what failures do. How do they strengthen you? Well, failures bring you down, mm -hmm. and if you if you if you deal with that well, um, and if you know that you have to learn something from failures, you can make something out of it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I just take a company uh, like Microsoft. I mean, the interactive TV work that we did, um, it wasn't a failure, but it was mm -hmm. certainly not the right time mm -hmm. at the right place. Yeah. Um, but we took a lot of what we did in interactive TV and made it work. Mm -hmm. The media player is a classic example right. of something we did out of the work that, that happened in interactive TV. How do you build a strong team and what do you look for in the players? Well, um, you've, you've obviously got to hire people who have uh, a certain set of values. Mm -hmm. And I think it, those values kind of bind the team together. For example, for example, that you've you've got you've got to be passionate about something. Mm -hmm. um, for example, you've got to, um, it, at least in Microsoft, you've got to be able to put up with criticism, mm -hmm. and you've got to value criticism and not kind of mm -hmm. worry about it too much. Um, so if you if you align in terms of values, then the next thing is to find the team with role players. Mm -hmm. Right, the best teams are the ones with role players. Um, you know, whether it's in baseball. And the more stars you have, the more problems you have. Right. 
Um, so you have to find people who are complementary to each other. Mm -hmm. um, so finding the right role players is, is pretty important. Mm -hmm. um, and then you've got to find a mission. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be something that's worthwhile to do, that people are agreed that they will use their roles and their values to go attack something that's worthwhile. So if, those, if you get those three things, mm -hmm. that'd good be things good. Happen. Have you ever had a team that didn't work? And if so, what did you do to fix it? Um, the, 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 it's, it's those three things. Mm -hmm. if, you, if you think you're not working, it is usually one of those three things. That it's not clear what, what, what your goal is or your mission is. Mm -hmm. That people aren't working well together, right? Which is that, that their values aren't aligned. Mm -hmm. Or you're too heavy with stars or too, you don't have mm -hmm. enough kind of players. Uh, players. Mm -hmm. it's, it's usually one of those three mm -hmm. things. And you've got to fix that. So you just reestablish the balance. That's right. Is it usually pretty obvious? Um, not always, no, mm -hmm. no, no, because um, sometimes it's, it's more obvious after you've been at it for a while and you, mm -hmm. just, you just realize it's just mm -hmm. too hard and it shouldn't be that mm -hmm. hard. And sometimes it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of staring you in the face. Because mm -hmm. those personnel decisions are sometimes the toughest ones right. to make mm -hmm. and you, you really want to be sure about those. That's right. So have you ever had an experience where you kind of waited too long? Yes, absolutely. Yeah? Yeah. And how did you make it okay again? Well. You have to make the hard decision in the end. Mm -hmm. And in the end, when you make that hard decision, after you sweated it out for three, four, five months, mm -hmm. and you go out and you talk to people, they tell you it was the right thing. They say, finally. Yes. <laughs> we've, we've been waiting. That's right. How do you lead people through the frequent reorgs at Microsoft? I think that can be very unsettling. Uh, again, you've got to have a strong mission. And if people know what they're doing, They'll do it, mm -hmm. come hell or high water. And, um, you know, it's the most important thing, I think, mm -hmm. in terms of leadership, mm -hmm. which is do people know where they're going or where you're taking them mm -hmm. or what they need to do when they come in every day? Mm -hmm. Reorg is just, I mean, it's the people who don't know what they're doing, where they're going, that have a problem with it. Right. Which of your skills are you most proud of? Um, when the going gets tough, mm -hmm. um, I'm at my best. Mm -hmm. And where do you wish you were stronger? Um, probably knowing when other people's limits mm. are, are close. Mm -hmm. I, I tend to kind of just put my head down and just, just say, go through it. Just, just I, I, can, I can probably be a little bit more sensitive. Yeah. How do you handle the stress? I mean, you talked about that intensity and you've had at least two breakpoints that we've kind of talked about where you recognize that you needed to stop and do something That's right. fairly different. But there's so much of the day-to-day -day stress that doesn't, doesn't push you to the limit but can still make you pretty cranky. How, how do you deal with that? Right. It's all mental first. And so you've got to have a mental breakpoint, whether it was my, you know, change the job because you just exercise a different part of the brain or you don't bring work home. Mm -hmm. That's another, you know, pretty sacred rule. Mm -hmm. I violate it only once or twice a year, but when, mm -hmm. when, it's, when it really is worthwhile doing it. But I try not, I, I try very hard not mm -hmm. to work when I get home mm -hmm. or on the weekends. Even if that means you end up staying at the office extra hours? No, I don't stay you don't at the do office that. You, you if have I can your, help it. You have your breakpoints. That's right. So you because manage it by just boundaries? That's right. That's how you, yeah. how you really do it. What are some of the things that you look for in a potential new hire? I mean, we talked about sort of your three critical areas, but what, what else are the things that you're looking for in those people specifically? Um, I'm looking for something that they believe in very deeply. Mm -hmm. And it, usually if you believe in things fairly deeply, you have a point of view about it, um, and you can get exercised about it, mm -hmm. and you've thought about it, uh, it's usually a good indicator mm -hmm. that they're going to do, do okay. Mm -hmm. Because... Um, you know, that's the kind of, you can call it passion, intensity, whatever mm -hmm. it is, um, that, that goes a long way. Can you sense when it's real and when it's put on? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Because you, you can, um, I'll give you my, my personal example. If I had not actually thought about architecture before I'd gotten the question, mm -hmm. if I hadn't actually secretly been planning to build my own house, mm -hmm. you know, after 30 minutes of questioning, I wouldn't have had right. 
the same level of intensity. And usually mm -hmm. you can find out it doesn't take that long. Mm -hmm. So you just go until you see where the breaking point right. is, and if it's far enough out, you know, you know it's real? That's right. Yeah. So besides passion, what are some of the other things you're looking for? Well, then you, then you start to look at things like, you know, can, can people articulate their point mm -hmm. of view? Um, can they synthesize mm -hmm. um, an opinion? Can they solve problems? Um, can they deal with people? Those, those kinds of issues really do come across, come through in a conversation. Mm -hmm. How long into, into an interview do you usually know? A couple of minutes. A couple of minutes. Yeah. That's pretty quick, and then, isn't and it? Then you, then, then you kind of keep poking and prodding. Mm -hmm. Given the prevalence of outsourcing, where would you recommend that our students start thinking about looking for jobs that may be staying here? Well, any, any, any job that has a high intellectual property component to it mm -hmm. is one that's going to, you know, if you assume that we have reached the limits of human innovation, then we're all in trouble. If you assume that we haven't, mm -hmm. then any place that pushes the envelope is a pretty good place to start. Mm -hmm. At least for the next couple of years until I think for the next couple of centuries until it's actually, a different until it's a different envelope. That's right, mm -hmm. and it's it's really it's really the 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 um, the things going on at the edges mm -hmm. of of uh, of innovation that that people should feel really comfortable mm -hmm. with. Do you have any favorite interview questions? Um, I used to. I don't. I don't ask that anymore. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have one, um, which is. Um, how do you lay out the di all of the digits, you know, from zero to nine, mm -hmm. on two blocks? I mean, mm -hmm. you know, when you go into a reception. Yeah, I got, uh, I got that one. Yeah, yeah, I got that one in, it's a, really in an interview. It's really hard. It is very it's hard. Really hard mm -hmm. And and what's the trick answer? I'm not going to tell. You're you. not going to tell us because <laughs> I'm gonna, gonna I might us. have to ask it. Again. <laughs> <laughs> it is a good question because the the first part is easy and you start to feel pretty happy with That's yourself right. and then you get caught. And then you have to make this leap of faith. Mm -hmm. Because all of rationality disappears right. at the last hurdle. Right. And that's when you, you understand whether a person is creative or not, whether they can take a risk or not, whether mm -hmm. they're thinking differently or not. It's a problem that actually looks at analytical versus mm -hmm. creative kind of. Thinking. What are some of the things that you've seen in interviews that very quickly make you say, not for us? Um, when people try to kind of sell too much mm -hmm. and um, it's it's I, I find at least that people kind of listen a little bit more sell a little bit less end up doing better mm -hmm. if you were starting a career today what type of job would you be looking for the same mm -hmm. <laughs> there's such a long way to go with technology of all types mm -hmm. and um, you know you know, there's 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 a saying: if you have a long enough um, lever, you can move the world. Mm -hmm. And technology is one such lever. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, it's changing the world. Whether it's medicine or you know XML, you know, there's there's things that are going to continue to change the world. We'll be back right after this. The University of Washington Business School, located in Seattle, Washington, ranks among the top business schools in the United States. Information Technology Leaders is one of the many ways the UW Business School forges partnerships and reaches out beyond the university. For more information about the University of Washington Business School or Information Technology Leaders, visit informationtechnologyleaders.com. Um, beyond just uh, networking, what would you say is the single most effective way to locate job opportunities in the information technology market once we finish school? I think in the end, at least based on my experience, um, knowing what you really want to do. It took me a while, right? It took me 24 years to figure out what I wanted to do. But once I did, once you do, you know, use that to your advantage. If you actually, people want, when, I, when, when we recruit, we want people who believe in something, who kind of are passionate about something. So once you figure out what you really care about, right, be sure to share that point of view, right? So for example, if you care about something very deeply, technology, an issue, right, write a, do a blog, right? 
people, people read your blogs, right? Yeah, blogging is this phenomenon on the, on the web right now, so I'm just using it as kind of a simple example, web blogs. Um, you know, make sure people kind of know what you stand for. So more, more than networking, you know, make sure you communicate what, what you stand for. You can write in the local newspaper. You can write a blog, right? So find something that you care about, develop an opinion, express an opinion, and people will find you. Okay. I'd like to close with a quote from someone that Sanjay works with. Sanjay is best known for his energy, intelligence, and intensity. His passion for the work of the group just oozes out of him. In addition to having an incredible strategic mind, he also has an amazing command of the details. I don't know how he does it. He provides very strong organizational glue where he deals with the rest of the company and lets us do our work. His determination is impressive and contagious. He's got us convinced there's nothing we can't do. Information Technology Leaders is sponsored by the Microsoft Corporation, a worldwide leader in software, services, and internet technologies for personal and business computing. Microsoft offers a wide range of products and services designed to empower people through software, anytime, any place, and on any device.